simply fabulous. I couldn't forget you. I couldn't forget you. It's all good. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, well, I'm very happy to be here with all my colleagues. I want to thank all the members of the council for the hard work over these last months. Uh, very collegial and productive process. And profound thanks to Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito and Chair Julissa Ferreras Copeland for <laughs> And I will say something at the beginning and something at the end that this is the last budget process for these two great leaders, and that's going to be a loss for New York City. And I want to thank you for all you have done. So there's a lot of good news in this budget I want to share with you now before you hear from the Speaker and the Chair. We've reached a budget agreement. The budget will be approximately $85.2 billion. Final details will be worked out in the next few days leading up to adoption early next week. We believe this budget continues our work in building a better and fairer city. Quick overview I will present before you hear from our colleagues. Again, want to note a lot of hard work from the council members, uh, a lot of hard work from the council finance staff, and of course, from everyone at OMB, uh, this is a process that literally, uh, it's like the Macy's Thanksgiving parade. They start the next budget the day after the <laughs> budget is, uh, is agreed on. So uh, OMB has been working all year, as has Council Finance, and they've done a great job. And I want to give a special thanks to Dean Foulihan for his leadership. Well done. <laughs> Our focus throughout has been uh, addressing the economic reality of New Yorkers, understanding there's still so many people in this town who have trouble making ends meet and who need a better life. That's where we've made our investments. But what has been a unifying reality between the council and the mayorality has been a focus on fiscal discipline. Uh, we understand what's happening in our nation. We understand the challenges emanating from Washington, D.C. So we had to both achieve those strategic investments while constantly being prepared for what may lay ahead. Uh, I fundamentally believe this budget has achieved both those goals. Uh, we talked previously uh, in the preliminary budget, in the executive budget, major new investments we'll be making, including 3K for all, including uh, air conditioning units for every classroom in our public schools, and a crucial down payment and beginning on a major improvement for our city, the Manhattan Greenway. These are examples of things that were addressed previously. Uh, we have additional investments that were major priorities for the council, for the administration, in some cases for both of us, that will be reflected in the new budget. Before I go into outlining some of those, I want to tell you a fact that's really important. This is, an, and it's something I want to say with congratulations to everyone gathered here and all the staff, this is the earliest budget agreement in a quarter century. The last time the budget handshake occurred this early was 1992. So a uh, real example and a real evidence of the fact that there was a lot of unity and partnership in this process. Um, we understood that we had to focus on the fiscal realities I mentioned because no one, no one mistakes what's happening in Washington. I think it's fair to say it gets stranger every day and more troubling every day. And so uh, on the administration side and with the strong urging of the council, we focused on continuing to deepen our savings program. At the time of the executive budget, I reported to you that uh, since November of 2016, through the November plan, the preliminary budget, and the executive budget, we had achieved $2.8 billion in savings. I will report to you now that we will be adding another $200 million in savings, taking our overall savings to over $3 billion. That will be achieved by $100 million more in debt service savings and $100 million in savings from the partial hiring freeze that we announced at the time of the executive. So now we're able to put 
an initial dollar figure to that of approximately $100 million. Uh, these reserves will be needed. I have to say the Council over these last years has constantly focused in the discussions on the need to increase reserves. And I want to give the Speaker and the Chair and all my colleagues credit. Uh, that takes uh, a lot of uh, big picture thinking. There's obviously a lot of important things we would like to address and a lot of important constituencies out there, but this Council has consistently come back to the fact that while we're doing other important things, we have to keep building our reserves. And I want to credit them for that discipline and that focus. The reserves now will be the highest in the history of New York City. We will be adding to them again in this plan. This will now be four years running. The Retiree Health Benefits Trust Fund will gain an additional $100 million and now will be pegged at $4.2 billion. The General Reserve will receive another $200 million and will now be at $1.2 billion. And the Capital Stabilization Reserve will continue at $250 million per year over the next four years. If you annualize that for the fiscal 18 budget, our reserves will total $5.65 billion, by far the highest the City of New York has ever had. There are some new investments that have been made. Uh, although, in general, they are not costly, we think they are going to be very important for the people of New York City. Uh, something I've focused on as a parent and someone involved in our school system over the last 20 years has been the fact that we've never actually addressed uh, a major gap in our school system, and that is the fact that many of our young people don't get physical education, don't get gym class, don't get uh, physical activity, and it isn't healthy for them and it isn't fair that some schools have it and still a number of schools don't. Uh, you'll see in uh, this budget a plan to get us to 100 percent uh, consistent phys ed in all our schools by the school year beginning in September 2021. That means 197 schools that right now do not have permanent phys ed facilities will have those facilities by September 2021. And I want to say this is about the health of our children, the physical health, the mental health as well, and it's about their ability to perform academically. A lot of our kids have been held back because they haven't had the support of phys ed. We think this is going to make a big difference. We, that's one end of the spectrum, our children. There's also a big focus in this budget on our seniors. I have to say up front that council fought very hard. All council members fought hard. Some, they, all, they all fought for the seniors, but some punch above their weight. Uh, and so, uh, with the agreement we have reached, we will eliminate the home care wait list and we'll be serving 3,000 seniors a year. There are other important investments for seniors, notably a new initiative to help caregivers. This is a growing reality as more and more seniors live longer lives, that more and more families uh, need to provide care for their elders, but they also need support in doing it. This has been a major priority for the Council. So we'll be providing vouchers that will help caregivers to have support come into the homes and give them a break, because so many people are stressed and need that help, and I congratulate the Council on that major new initiative. We focus as well on those who have served us, and uh, I have to say the uh, reality of these last few days, having gone through Fleet Week and Memorial Day, a time of reflection on what our members of the armed services do for us and what we owe our veterans. And I want to thank all of the members of the Council. I want to thank, this has been a bipartisan initiative. And uh, thank you, Councilman Matteo. <laughs> Are you, are you converting them? What's going on here? You know, I'd like more time. Yeah, right. Give them time. Uh, well, we in this city together have taken some major steps forward for our veterans. And the thing I'm particularly proud of is the effort we made together to end chronic homelessness among our veterans, and we achieved that goal. But there's so much more we need to do. 
And I preface by saying, because this is the blunt and honest truth, if our federal government, and this is totally bipartisan because it's been true under both Democratic and Republican administrations, if our federal government had been doing all it should for our veterans, we might not have to have this part of the conversation. But once again, localities have to step up where the federal government's been absent. And there's something we can do for our veterans, and this was a major priority for both the administration and the council. This budget expands the property tax exemption for veterans who served in wartime, and it's going to put money back in their pocket. And it's what we owe our vets. This will be an average savings of $443 per year per veteran homeowner on top of the existing exemption of $421 per year. So that's going to be money back in the pocket of our veterans. Another example of an area where the Council and the Administration both felt very strongly we needed to take action relates to our nonprofit sector. Uh, particularly when it comes to the social services that people in New York City rely on, so much of that is provided by our nonprofit sector, and over many years, probably even decades, that sector has been underfunded in many ways. Uh, a lot of concern has been raised. We knew we had to do more. So there are major investments in uh, this sector in the budget to provide some relief, to provide some of the resources so that nonprofit organizations can fare better and do their work better and have economic stability they deserve. So a major investment in our nonprofits. Look, uh, once again, there's a lot to be proud of. We're particularly proud that it's a balanced budget, it's a fiscally disciplined budget, it's a compassionate budget, but one thing we're particularly proud of, it's not just an on-time budget, it's ahead of schedule. And again, credit to everyone here for that discipline and that focus to get it done. Now, a few words in Spanish. Estamos anunciando con el Consejo Municipal un presupuesto justo, equitativo y inteligente. Nuestro plan incluye dinámicas inversiones enfocadas para ayudar a más neoyorquinos a tener una vida digna. Ese es un gran paso hacia una ciudad más justa y mejor para nuestros niños, ancianos, veteranos y todos los neoyorquinos. With that, I want to just say, as I introduce the speaker, uh, she has been an extraordinary partner over the last four years. Uh, we knew each other well before we each assumed these roles. Uh, we knew uh, that we had a lot of respect and trust for each other. We knew that we shared values. We didn't know what it would be like to play these roles. We didn't know what our partnership would be like. We didn't know what the times ahead would be or what the issues we'd face would be. But there was a core belief that uh, if you share values, a lot of good things can happen. And many, many conversations over many years, mostly in agreement, sometimes not. But we always found a way to get to a good outcome and with great support from all our colleagues. So uh, for me, I can tell you uh, I'll be sorry when these four years are over because it has been such a great and positive and productive uh, partnership. As a progressive, I want to thank Melissa Mark Viverito for helping to move this city in a new progressive direction. And uh, the things she has championed are going to have a huge impact on this city for many years to come. So with that, I introduce the Speaker of the City Council, Melissa Mark Viverito. Gracias, Alcalde de Blasio. Thank you so much. Um, uh, she says, for your... thank you, Mayor de Blasio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your partnership um, over these past four budgets and really been an incredible experience to be able to serve this wonderful, beautiful city and diverse city and, and make it a more inclusive city. And that is what the partnership, I think, has brought uh, these last four budgets, and very proud of my colleagues for having joined me uh, in making that a reality. So um, before we begin, I wanted to definitely take a moment uh, to recognize the tremendous work of our finance chair, Julissa Ferreras Copeland. Um, uh, 
chairing the Finance Committee is no small feat, and over the last four years, Julie Sa, alongside the Council's amazing Finance Director, LaTanya McKinney. Yeah. and our unparalleled finance staff, who is all throughout here. Um, have brought real depth, substance, and analysis to the Council's budget hearings, and have helped make this a negotiation process that we can all be proud of. I could not ask for a better friend or colleague than Finance Chair Ferreras Copeland. Julissa, at a time when women are vastly underrepresented in elected office, including, unfortunately, here in the City Council, your tenacity, leadership, and staunch advocacy on behalf of all New Yorkers has been so very welcome and necessary. I know I speak for all the members and, of course, your constituents when I say that we will dearly miss our chica from Corona. <laughs> So obviously this is a bit of an emotional moment for me. Four years ago when my colleagues bestowed on me the honor of serving as speaker, I vowed to make this a more open, transparent, and collaborative council. And that is exactly what we have been able to do. We have passed a record number of bills, established the most forward-thinking immigration policy in the nation, expanded our police force, invested in our young people, and shed light on the plight of marginalized New Yorkers as we turned the page on criminal justice reform and worked to make our city more fair and just for all people. And throughout it all, we have demonstrated that not only is it possible to govern collaboratively, it is necessary. Because we are most effective when we work together to build consensus around a greater common good. And that is what this budget reflects. Hundreds of hours of thoughtful, deliberative conversations, careful review, and a continued commitment to uplifting all New Yorkers across the five boroughs. The fiscal year 2018 executive budget, my last as speaker, encompasses the progressive ideals this City Council has championed throughout my tenure. From supporting our most vulnerable populations, including our veterans, our seniors, and our immigrants, because yes, if you live here, work here, or send your children to school here, you are a New Yorker, to creating, <laughs> to creating new job opportunities for our young people and expanding access to the city's emergency food assistance program. <laughs> right. This truly is a budget for all New Yorkers, a smart, responsible, balanced, not to mention on-time budget, that strengthens our communities, our neighbors, and our entire city, all while preparing for any uncertainties that may lie ahead. I'm incredibly proud of the work of the budget negotiation team, the council, and the administration as we put an end to the budget dance, secure our city's continued financial success, and deliver the earliest budget agreement in recent history. An agreement that baselines 70,000 summer youth jobs for our young people. A staggering investment this City Council has consistently advocated for. An agreement that supports New York City's bravest by providing four million to make sure to make sure every single firefighter has an additional pair of much needed work boots. Yes. An agreement that supports the courageous men and women of our armed forces by granting the 56,000 veterans who own homes in New York City with property tax exemptions to reduce their tax burden by hundreds of dollars. This budget, yes. <laughs> This budget also makes an $88 million commitment over five years to ensure all human service providers have a 10% overhead rate and right-sizing contracts for vital services, including adult protective services, runaway homeless youth, and ACS contracts. But that's not all. The City Council has led the charge to increase savings and prepare for the future. 
So I'm thrilled to announce that the fiscal year 2018 budget, as the mayor indicated, also increases the city's reserves by 300 million, bringing our total reserves to 9.612 billion, enough to weather any storm. And even as we continue to responsibly plan and budget for our future, we're also doubling down on investments to tackle inequality, advance fairness, and support historically underrepresented populations, including women, children, and the aging. That's why we're establishing a Young Women's Initiative Office and investing 400,000 to support long-acting reversible contraceptives. <laughs> Why are we expanding universal free lunch and breakfast in the classroom to cover all elementary school students? Why? Thanks in no small part to the relentless, and I do mean relentless advocacy of Majority Leader Van Bramer. We're investing $110 million in capital funding for libraries. And why uh, we're baselining, as the mayor also indicated, and the relentless advocacy of Margaret Chin, $22.89 million to support our seniors. Yeah. This is a budget for every single person who calls our city home and is a budget only Yorkers can and should be proud of. You'll be hearing more from Julissa, our finance chair, in just a moment. But again, I just want to say how proud I am of all of our work, to my colleagues, to each and every one of you, to bring transparency and equity to our budget and to New Yorkers. And we've done this in partnership together. Um, I want to thank you, Mayor de Blasio, these last four years working together on this budget. You have been a wonderful partner and a fierce champion for all New Yorkers. And um, with that, I'll just say a few words in Spanish. Hace cuatro años, cuando mis colegas me otorgaron el honor de servir como presidenta, prometí crear un consejo más abierto, transparente y colaborativo. Y eso es lo que estamos haciendo con este presupuesto. Este es un presupuesto que refleja meses de serias negociaciones entre el consejo municipal y el alcalde. Y es un presupuesto que todos los neoyorquinos pueden y deben, de, deben de estar orgullosos. Entre los logros están los 70,000 empleos juveniles de verano para nuestros jóvenes, una enorme inversión que este ayuntamiento ha defendido constantemente. También invirtió para ayudar a los más valientes de la ciudad de Nueva York, proporcionando 4 millones para asegurar de que cada bombero tenga un par adicional de botas muy necesarias. E hicimos un acuerdo que apoya a los valientes hombres y mujeres de nuestras arma, fuerza, Fuerzas Armadas al otorgar a las 56 mil veteranos que poseen casas en Nueva York con exenciones de impuestos a la propiedad para reducir su carga tributaria en cientos de dólares. Y quiero reconocer el tremendo trabajo de nuestra presidenta de finanzas, Julissa Ferreras Copeland. Presidir el comité de finanzas no es un trabajo pequeño ni es fácil. Y durante los últimos cuatro años ella ha hecho un gran trabajo. Y también le queremos dar las gracias a la directora de finanzas del Consejo Municipal, la Tanya McKinney, y nuestro personal de finanzas sin precedentes han aportado profundidad, sustancia y análisis a las audiencias presupuestarias del Consejo y han ayudado a hacer este presupuesto. Um, este es un proceso de negociación de que hoy todos podemos estar orgullosos. Again, thank you. It's been a privilege to negotiate these budgets to build a better uh, city. And uh, I look forward to the work ahead. Thank you very much. We realized we had to actually do a handshake. It's very important. Um, just a personal note in calling uh, Jalissa forward. Um, a long time ago, I met Jalissa, and after knowing her for a while, I found out she had been involved in some kind of mentorship program for young leaders when she was a teenager. And I got to know her over the years, and she always impressed me, and with every passing year, she impressed me more. And I thought to myself, wow, sometimes those young leaders programs really work out. <laughs> so so uh, she's still a young leader. And uh, Jalissa, it's been a joy working with you in many, many different parts of our careers. But I have to say, uh, you've outdone yourself as finance chair. 
Uh, you have stayed true to your values. You have stayed true to the people you represent and the community you come from and never lost sight of that. But you've also been a, a wonderful example of someone who had a clear, strong vision, but also always knew how to work with all of your colleagues. And I think people have just felt good when they work with you. So uh, again, you will be sorely missed but you should feel very good today at the conclusion of yet another successful budget. Our finance chair, Jalissa Ferreras. Okay, family, I'm not sure if you heard, but this is my last budget. <laughs> I want to start by thanking the mayor for remaining in touch with the inner, his inner council member and respecting the council's role in this process. But I would also like to thank you uh, on a deeply personal level for lending me your support as a colleague and a friend and for bringing our city a step closer to truly being equal. So thank you. To my sister, Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, gracias for seeing the leader in me and for placing the fiscal negotiations of this city in my hands. You have led this council with wisdom and sensitivity that only a Puerto Rican woman from El Barrio <laughs> could have. And it has been exactly what this council has needed. I want to thank the entire finance division. You are some of the most brilliant and diligent individuals I have ever had the pleasure of working with. Behind every successful budget handshake, there is a smart, no-nonsense team leader in finance director Latanya McKinney. Thank you as well to Director Fulahan the staff at OMB, and all of our commissioners. You have shared my commitment in this process, and it's been a pleasure working with you. I must also say that as we've seen with the women here today, we all benefit from having women in the room. One of your greatest hires, Mr. Mayor, and I want to just say publicly, um, is one amazing woman, and that's Emma Wolf. <laughs> we got her to blush. We got her to blush. She is laser sharp. She is laser sharp and very dedicated to our city. Emma, I want to publicly thank you for your support and advice and for being there from the very beginning of my career. Thank you to the Council's budget negotiating team and the delegation chairs for all your insight and hard work. And we cannot forget all the legislative and budget directors, the chief of staff, including the chief of all staffs, Mr. Ramon Martinez. He doesn't want you to take his picture, so he's not here. Uh, district, the central staff that allows us to be here, the district office staff. I want to thank the staff over the last nine years for their dedication to our community and supporting me every day. I have had the privilege of serving as finance chair and representing my community for nine years. I am grateful to my community for believing in me and giving this girl from Corona a voice and a seat at the head of the table. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, I want to thank my family and my parents, my husband. My husband, Aaron, has not only shown me true love, but supported me in every career decision I have ever made. Because in his vows, he stated he wanted nothing more than for me to grow and shine. My mother, or as Julian calls her, Boela, has been a rock and my roots, allowing me to grow and flourish, all while keeping me firmly grounded and reminding me that when I walk into her house, I am not a council member. <laughs> she has made tremendous sacrifice out of pure love. She is everything I want to be for my son. With that, I want to acknowledge the men and women standing behind me. Like me, they have made many trade-offs in order to be here. Every day they are fighting for better opportunities for New York City's families while often leaving their own. 
They juggle children, spouses, parents, and loved ones. They miss birthdays. They postpone family gatherings. They fight. They cry. But what I enjoy seeing the most is their laughs, because every elected official here is human too. And I want everyone to understand that. My self-imposed two-term limit is squarely and profoundly a human decision. I know it is customary in politics for us to speculate about why a person with so many opportunities would choose a different path. I am standing here as an empowered, wise Latina, letting you know that being fully there for my family is a great opportunity and a choice for me. So with that being said, so without of the way, um, so now that we have that, um, and as the speaker and I deliver our last budget for the city, I'd like to take a moment to remind you of some of the council's great budgetary accomplishments. We've ended the ridiculous budget dance and focused on funding some of the most consequential initiatives as the speaker outlined. After 20 years of no enhancements, we expanded funding to beacon programs together. Amen. We established a year-round employment program for young people, and we've proven that supporting libraries and supporting cultural institutions does make this city better. <laughs> these, these accomplishments have contributed to a fairer city and a more transparent and more responsive budget that can truly serve the needs of our communities, from the immigrant family to the single mom to the business owner and to the property owner. So thank you. Serving as your finance chair has been the privilege of a lifetime. He tenido el privilegio de representar el Distrito 21 en Queens durante los últimos nueve años donde he luchado por la educación de nuestros hijos, el bienestar de nuestras familias y el derecho de la comunidad inmigrante. Como saben, he tomado la decisión de no postularme a la reelección, ya que después de mucho tiempo viviendo lejos de mi esposo, quiero reunificar a mi familia. Esta es una decisión que yo he tomado, pero con el respaldo de muchos que me quieren aquí. So, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Okay, it is time for questions on this budget. Questions, questions, questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, did you hear mention how you come to a conclusion in terms of the money for lawyers for immigrants who are at risk or are being deported? Will that cover immigrants, lawyers for immigrants for all crimes or just for some crimes? How did that? Let me frame it for a moment. I'll give my views and the speaker will give hers. Uh, let's talk about what we agree on first. We agree that the city of New York should help undocumented people who are facing deportation. And that's been a strong consensus. Uh, we understand these are our fellow New Yorkers. These are families that could be torn apart. Uh, we want to be there in support. Um, the vast majority of those cases involve people who have either committed no crime or a very minor crime. Uh, so where there is a difference and has been a difference is regarding those very small number of people, very small number each year, who uh, are convicted of one of the offenses on our list of 170 offenses. And we have a difference on that. But it did not stop us from moving forward the pieces we do agree on, which is the vast majority of this program, uh, to make sure that there is funding for those facing deportation, again, the vast majority of whom have either committed no crime or only a very minor offense that's not on that list. Hold on, we can do this. There we go. Uh, we have, in the City Council, we have maintained our New York Family Unity Project uh, whole and complete. And we continue to believe that that system is a model that we would like to continue moving forward. And so uh, we've actually uh, put money in to preserve it as it is in its current form. So I'm not sure what the answer is. Is it you are going to fund lawyers who will defend immigrants? We are acknowledging a difference. Now I'm going to answer your question. We're acknowledging a difference. 
And uh, right now, what we've all agreed on is there needs to be money for uh, legal services for undocumented folks uh, facing deportation. Uh, the issue will be resolved in the contracting process. Now, I have very strong views I've made clear, and the contracting process uh, resides in the executive branch. So I'll leave it at that. Yes. If I can follow up, so I have two questions. So there's a 10 million from the council for the program, and it's the 16 that you had a, that you had announced at the executive state. Dean Fulahan, come on over. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. You're so shy. Yes, the 16 million that was in the executive budget will be part of the adaptive budget. <laughs> <laughs> That was that was smooth. So it's the 16, Dean, 16 plus 10. 16 plus 10 is 26. The 16 million, are you saying that you haven't decided yet whether or not that will cover? This is an example of the phrase detente. We have, a, no, it really is. We have a difference. The issue will be resolved in the contracting process, and the contracting process resides in the executive branch. So we'll leave it at that. Speaker said that they're going to keep knife up the same as it has been. Great. So you, the council is going to separately fund a program that has been universally covering the people. It has to be put through a contracting process. But does it have to be put through? I mean, it hasn't. It has to be put through a contracting process. No, it still has to be put through a contracting process. I'm sorry. It has not gone through that kind of process before because it's been discretionary funding from the council. Well, I mean, Dean will explain the functional process to you. Yeah, well, there's differences in life. We agree on most things. Right. So, again, the 16 million that was in the executive budget was delineated as we did during the, as we said during the executive budget, and it deals with a huge portion of the population that had not been served. The council is putting, is enhancing their program and putting that forward. However, it still goes through the administrative process and the, it still goes through an executive contracting process through HRA and that negotiation is still to occur. And that process will go and the mayor was clear about the parameters that the administration has. Um, our expectation as a city council is that the program that we have put forward is going to continue and move forward in that way. So you're going to assign the budget, though, and it's essentially going to have, like, a, a TK or, like, detailed TBA in it? I think that's fair. Can you explain why it has to be a TK and not a TBA? I think there may be legal services somewhere they deserve, but not with New York City taxpayer dollars. It's just as simple as that. We have a difference. It's just my philosophical view that that's not where we should be putting our money. And I think we have a lot of other things we need to do with that money, including the legal services for those who do not fall in that category, who are the vast majority of those who need the help. It's still a limited pot of money. I want to see it go to people I think need the help the most. Yes. Um, Mayor, this is presumably the most dire financial outlook the city has seen since you've been in office, you know, based on kind of the outlook you've given us in your preliminary and executive plans and... Yeah, let me just interrupt for a second to say, I really want to clarify right at the beginning of the question. It's actually, in some ways, the least dire in terms of economic circumstances. It's the most dire in terms of governmental circumstances. The challenge is, as we've discussed before, we don't know how that's going to shake out. So compared to the year or two at the beginning, where I think we felt the economy was much more of a question mark, uh, this is a situation where the economy is pretty strong in the scheme of things, and that's not what worries us. The projections going a few years ahead look relatively strong. It's an X factor in Washington, but we do not know where that is going. And that's why I, dire may not be the right word. There's a potential for something dire, but we don't know if that's what's going to happen. You've also cited slowing revenues coming into the city on taxes other than property tax. So I guess my question slowing is... Slowing revenue growth. Slowing revenue growth. Yeah. So my, my question is, um, you know, with, with that circumstance in mind and with all the discussion today about fiscal responsibility, this mm -hmm. budget is significantly bigger than the deal that you shook hands on a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's bigger than the deal that you put forward. How can it be both full of savings and a responsible deal and be growing? Fair question, because the reserves 
continue to not only be strong, but to be growing. Uh, and because we continue to find greater savings all the time, and we're moving into new areas of savings, like uh, the partial hiring freeze, and we will continue to as needed. So the way I, I think I've come to understand budgeting through this experience over four years is you deal with the realities you know, and you, you prepare for the unknown. In terms of the realities we know, we have the revenue, and we have to make investments for the good of the city. But we have the biggest reserves we've ever had, and they are ample to address anything that could happen to us in the short term. If bigger, longer-term things happen, that's why there's constant updates in the budgeting process where we could make major course corrections if we need to. Let's see, there's Anne. Yes. Uh, we have the problems some details about the hiring freeze. I'll give you what I got so far, and then Dean can jump in, and we'll have more, obviously, between now and adoption. One hundred million dollars. All agencies will be touched by it. Uh, three major areas uh, of impact. One is any newly uh, proposed hire will be evaluated by OMB, and they will determine whether to allow it to go forward or not. And this is, again, all this is in administrative and managerial fields. This is not frontline uh, service providers. The second is lines that have not been filled but exist in the budget already will be subject to uh, being shut down. So the OMB will look at those lines, and they may decide in a number of cases that a line that has not been filled will be pulled back from the budget of that agency. And then lastly, delays in hiring. There may be a line that there is a decision is worthy, but instead of hiring you know, on one point in time, it will be delayed for the savings impact. That combination is going to net us at least $100 million. All those three things. Yes. And um, that's $100 million, million worth of expected savings, right? It's a, well, we're convinced we will have it absolutely for fiscal 18, expense budget, all agencies combined, minimum $100 million from the partial hiring freeze. See so if there's any other questions? Any other questions? Yes? Go back over the, um, what you were able to do on the nonprofit contracting. I think sure. it's the dollar figure and exactly what's in it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. There are two, uh, there are two provisions. Remember in the preliminary budget, uh, we did a major wage adjustment for the not-for-profits. They had not had a wage. We actually, the very early in the administration, together we did 2.5% wage adjustment and a minimum wage increase, funded the minimum wage increase through the $15, which is unusual. So we did that in the preliminary budget. We added three years of 2% wage increases. So it's a 2% wage increase in, the, in 18 and then another 2%. In 19, another 2% in 20, it's a compounded 6.12%. In addition, in this, we address the other concerns that they have been raising, which includes their indirect cost. As the speaker pointed out, we will be getting over a five-year period to a 10% reimburse, indirect reimbursement rate. That starts at roughly around $14 million, and that, and that grows almost to, uh, to $90 million by the fifth year. In addition, we have a model budgeting process, which in the executive we started with uh, the uh, homeless shelters at DHS, and that was a uh, that grows to a 36 million commitment in the executive budget. We now have expanded it, and the speaker delineated where those were. They are in the in the upcoming fiscal year, runaway and homeless youth, uh, preventative services and adult protective services, and then we have a goal to continue that process over the, the next three years. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, if I could go back to the $10 million for an iPhone. Um, did you feel that there was going to be, did you feel that there was going to be a, a, a gap left Did the council didn't step in and, and put up that money? Uh, what was part of the, 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 the calculus that helped you get and did you think that there was going to be a need that wasn't going to be met? No, look, this, this, um, the, the NIFA program, uh, my last year as council member, my, before my first year as speaker, I think we had only initiated as a pilot of $500,000. My first year as speaker, 
I forget the amount of money we really put in the amount it might have been four million uh, and then obviously the need grew to six point five which is what we had in last year's budget uh, and we you know very clearly with the advocates you know defined a program which provides services to all uh, and and we believe that that model is one that works and we would like to definitely uh, continue and there was a lot of advocacy on behalf of the council members to maintain the program as it is. And so that is why we continue to invest in the program and actually expand it under our uh, discretionary allocations and continue to stand by that. And again, obviously, a difference of opinion, and we're going to have to continue to engage in those conversations. But this is a program that is very important to the council. Um, I personally feel uh, very, very strongly about it because it is something that uh, I initiated and fully funded under my leadership, and so we'll be advocating strongly to maintain it as is. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. The capital budget, my understanding when you first announced your executive budget that it was increasing from this year's budget about $6 million, and knowing that you know we have this new gym initiative, Universal gym classes for everyone. That seems like it has a hefty price tag. How much is the capital budget now versus what it was expected? So there are programs that have been added, and when we put out the uh, the financial plan, we'll give you the details that delineate that total amount. We're still finalizing the details. Yeah, I don't. I think there have been several meaningful pieces, but nothing that fundamentally changes the number. I think that's the the bigger <coughs> reality here. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Last one. Last one. Or last two. Go ahead. You guys are trying to negotiate. Who gets it? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we, we have you here. Um, did you, or a uh, uh, pressure, or anyone on your staff pressure anyone on the break? We're talking about budget right now. Budget. Uh, I'm telling you. So if you have a budget question, because we do this every year, we talk about the budget at the budget announcement. So, one more time, does anyone have a budget question? Otherwise, wait, you have a, is there a hand out there? No, we want to talk about the budget. So, again, my friend, this is an annual thing we do. We talk about the budget when we have the budget handshake. So, last call. All right, thanks, everyone. All right.